Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Qualitative Biased Personal and Speculative Remarks on Digitization, Digitalization, and Digital Transformation, presented by Sean McGuire, GSK Associate Fellow, Comparative and Translational Sciences Veterinarian, GlaxoSmithKline. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. McGuire. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thanks very much for that. Um, and um, I'd like to thank uh, the LabRoots folks for uh, bringing me back for this uh, 2019 uh, presentation. Um, as I get started, just want to uh, mention that um, occasionally um, in person and also over uh, video, I am uh, someone who will uh, stutter here and there. Um, and, and, and so um, if you hear that, uh, it's not due to the streaming or buffering quality of your connection. Um, so um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Sean uh, McGuire. These are some other uh, Sean uh, McGuire's that are um, slightly more famous and uh, photogenic than I, um, but um, just so there's no confusion. Um, a, um, at, at this point, a somewhat uh, standard uh, disclaimer that I'll give. Um, all views, opinions, future-looking statements, suppositions, and errors are mine and not those of GSK. Anything really insightful, I say, was likely influenced by my colleagues, and errors in grammar or spelling are not the fault of the Philadelphia Public Schools. Um, so, um, you know, this is me in my current role at... Uh, with a GSK, um, and um, before any of you um, choose to invest the next uh, 15 minutes or so um, of your time, I want to be clear about um, what this presentation is not. Um, and so I'm not going to be um, digging into, you know, a wonderful uh, data set from some, um, you know, fresh out of uh, statistics. Uh, research um, that I just completed. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to lay out a clear path on how to uh, integrate some of this nascent um, technology into our preclinical studies. Um, and I'm also not going to um, really dive into any specific uh, technologies. Um, I'll be raising some um, broad questions um, and um, probably not a whole lot of um, answers around this topic. Um, but what I will be covering um, is a collection of um, my opinions, questions, and other assorted thoughts about the intersection of these developing technologies and preclinical studies with a primary focus on the, uh, on the uh, discovery space um, within the realm of drug uh, discovery. Um, and so as a way of starting, um, um, I wanted to highlight what I think about uh, when we talk about this topic of uh, digitization. Um, and so this is, um, um, this is borrowed uh, from the clinical realm. Um, and actually throughout this presentation, um, I'm going to highlight some things that I've um, that I've become um, familiar with in the clinical space, um, and and so it's really about using some of these new technologies um, both to uh, both to innovate 
right, to do things in, in a way that we have not done them before, as well as um, to actually run um, effective um, preclinical uh, studies. Um, and some of the advantages of these digital technologies are really around a um, increase both in statistical power and sensitivity, right? We are talking about technologies that allow us to do very frequent um, data uh, collection and to collect things um, either that we haven't collected before or ways that are much less um, invasive to the animal um, and are often um, much less resource intensive um, from the perspective of the researcher. Um, so, um, um, you know, when we say digital endpoints, um, I found this definition helpful, um, helpful to me, right? So, um, um, so these are a way of um, collecting um, patient outcomes or, you know, um, in, in our setting um, to get a better sense of what's going on in the animal. Um, in a continuous or semi-continuous way. And this will enable the possibility of these digital endpoints, um, right? So, so we would move from making a um, cage side observation to be able to look at a, a, a real-time output um, of these digital, um, digital technology measures. Um, and so it's, um, it's certainly happening. Um, and it's happening both in the clinical and the preclinical space. Um, I just want to highlight this, um, this uh, report. Um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, all right, so looking at uh, um, patients with Parkinson's disease or Huntington's uh, disease, um, and they were able to uh, collect data in, um, in such a way where they're not really having to um, interrupt um, the patient's normal daily uh, routine, but you know, to start to be able to pick up things like differences in sleep pattern in a much more, um, in a much more specific and likely meaningful way um, than asking a patient, you know, how have you been uh, sleeping? Um, this, um, 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 this information, um, as well as some other information um, that I use in this talk, um, comes from a, a recommendation called um, what's, uh, uh, Developing Technology Derived Novel Endpoints for Use in Clinical Trials. Um, and that's a NIH and um, academic and industry um, collaborative effort. Um, and and um, um, so specifically, that's called the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative. Um, and they highlight what they see as some of the benefits of these technology-derived endpoints. Um, and as we take a look at them, I think that um, many of us in the preclinical space can see um, how some of these are directly applicable to the work and the studies that we do. Um, and that even those that are not directly applicable um, have some um, 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 have some parallel um, have some parallel as well. Um, as I think about trying to bring these technologies into our preclinical studies, um, I find it important for me to um, you know keep the end goal in mind that that the um, that the truly valuable preclinical studies um, are, are those that are the most translationally relevant. Um, and I do think that many of these, um, many of these digital technologies that we're talking about and are being developed, um, we have an opportunity to line up very well what happens in the preclinical setting uh, um, um, and the clinical setting. Um, so I think there is a tremendous opportunity for improvements in how we best understand our preclinical efforts and how we care and use 
and, and how we care and use animals for this important effort. The developing and possible impacts on animal use, welfare, study design, intervention, analysis, um, interpretation, and translational relevance are critical. And as a community, I think we have an obligation to pursue. Will these technologies allow us to do a better job of digitizing routine, preclinical patient care, subject management, how we observe our animals? And if we started to do that, what would be the follow-on improvements in understanding things at an even higher level? Are, uh, you know, what's going on in a particular, in a particular room, um, in the facility as a whole? Um, and um, um, how will seeing trends over time um, improve both what we do in a study sense as well as a care and welfare sense? Um, um, you know, I think the answer to those questions are absolutely, and there are um, 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 really well done uh, publications and posters out there um, to support that. Um, I think the challenge is how do we find the way to implement and integrate these technologies, which will allow us to evolve them in a manner that supports scientific discovery and improves animal care and welfare. Um, in thinking about some of the differences between human clinical studies and our preclinical efforts, it is important to note that clinical studies use the infrastructure that's built around the provision of medicine to the patient. As an oversimplification, especially in the discovery setting, we have a minimalist infrastructure onto which we add, in a mostly targeted way, specific technology to provide observations, markers, or endpoints. If we want a more robust, similar data set in the preclinical space, then a more robust infrastructure is required. Um, right, and, and so, Patients in clinical trials are still first treated as patients in a much more um, holistic way where um, 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 many things are looked at in addition to the study goals. We have an opportunity to do something similar with um, um, much of the digital technology that we're talking about for our preclinical species. Um, so when do we as individual researchers or as part of a larger effort decide to invest budget um, into these technologies? And how do we handle the challenge of the, the technology doesn't do everything that I want it to right now versus the fact that much of this technology allows us to do things that we have not ever done before? Um, you know, how do we assess the promised value and impact that a technology could, should, might um, provide against actual investment costs? And those costs include time, people resource, and opportunity costs. How do we assess costs of implementation against costs of the status quo, right? If we're, um, if these technologies will allow us to do um, to do more effective and efficient preclinical studies, um, and we're not investing in them now, um, um, you know, um, um, there can be certainly an imagined cost um, to just staying with the status quo. Um, all right, so I already showed this um, slide earlier, and right, uh, um, you know, again, I think that there's a great amount of um, overlap um, between what they're talking about in the clinical space and what we're talking about in the preclinical space. Um, one of the great advantages of these developing digital technologies is a continuous or semi-continuous monitoring and data recording, and that they move from they can move us from qualitative assessments to quantitative or semi-quantitative. Some of these technologies will allow us to move from infrequent point in time and subjective observations to more frequent and qualitative observations. An advantageous aspect of many of these technologies is around reproducibility, reducing bias, and possibly even on the documentation side of things. 
And I suggest that all of these will improve the value of research as well as the care and use of animals. Um, as I look at the comparisons between what is um, currently available in the human clinical space, um, including patient, customer, consumer owned um, technology, say such as smartwatches and phones, um, and even extending that look into the veterinary medicine clinical space and the um, types of technologies that are available to pet owners for their pets, um, and what we are routinely using and what's available in the preclinical space preclinical discovery space, I feel that we are somewhat lagging behind in our adaptation of these technologies, as well as the current state of what's available. And to be clear, these comments should not be taken as a way of minimizing the great efforts, investment, and impact um, of, of, of colleagues and companies that are actively working in this space. Um, because in fact, um, um, without them, um, right? We would not be having this conversation at all. Um, and so um, why the lag? So I, I wonder if it has to do with the infrastructure issue that I mentioned before. Um, I wonder if it's been hindered by, um, certainly in the drug discovery setting, um, um, our um, sometimes reticence about how we share data. Um, the challenge in um, trying to work out what the perceived um, cost of benefit is, um, and that um, um, when it comes down to actually spending on the technology, um, who um, whose budget um, um, should that outlay come from? Um, I think there's also an appropriate concern about the regulatory space um, and how some of the regulatory agencies may handle um, or may uh, respond to um, um, some preclinical studies that um, uh, use this data, and, and certain standards and practices um, need to be need to be developed. Um, and um, um, with most of the remaining slides, I just want to highlight some uh, clinical, um, some current clinical applications. Um, and 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 how they may be um, relevant um, to the work that we do, um, and and so um, currently in the in the preclinical space, looking at respiratory rate um, is a challenge, um, and it's um, with um, without some of this dig digital technology, um, it is difficult to do in a continuous or semi continuous way, um, what this human paper points out is that um, if you can track respiratory rate variability, um, that as a prognostic factor, um, um, that it has a great value. And so there are certainly preclinical models that we use where if we have the ability to measure respiratory rate and can therefore look at respiratory rate variability, um, we have an opportunity to to um, to develop a measure like that um, as an endpoint, um, and and um, which would allow um, um, a different type of of intervention um, in a animal study. Um, Again, um, another paper looking at the um, at the at the value of um, respiratory rate. This one in patients with with a pneumonia, um, and so what they found is that respiratory rate is an independent risk marker for in hospital mortality, um, and 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 so I I suggest that um, you know this. Um, um, this provides some insight, again, um, maybe particularly relevant to some preclinical uh, respiratory focused models, but the, that there is an opportunity as we can measure more and different things um, to establish truly predictive as well as meaningful um, endpoints. Um, 
I thought this was a um, interesting paper from the perspective of they highlight the fact that um, in the human setting, respiratory rate is often measured manually and discontinuously by counting of chest wall, right? And certainly in the veterinary medicine space, um, we do that as well. Um, in, in many of our preclinical species, um, it is a challenge to do. I, um, um, I can't count that fast um, um, for, say, a, um, um, a mouse that is um, a respiring uh, a very quickly and um, getting, a, um, um, getting a um, respiratory rate from some of our other species in a um, setting where they're freely moving is, is certainly a challenge. Um, but what they did in, in this paper is, is they, they, they took a measure, um, a respiratory rate, um, and found a way to measure it in a less invasive way, right? Um, the patient um, um, isn't even aware that, um, um, that it's being, that the data is being uh, collected. Um, it, it counts it in a less biased and more objective way um, and in a continuous or semi-continuous way. Um, and all of that allows for, um, allows for um, respiratory rate um, 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 to be used as a way of highlighting which patients are at greatest risk and which, which patients, patients require uh, um, intervention. We think about it in the preclinical space, and this may actually provide a more sensitive measure than some of our um, currently used um, markers of a disease. Um, so um, um, this is a paper that um, 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 highlights the value of a wearable um, um, to collect a number of things, um, including heart rate and I believe um, oxygen uh, saturation. Um, and from those, um, 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 a number of other uh, parameters can also be uh, calculated. Um, and that they've gone ahead and done the comparison with the wearable measure um, and the gold standards. Um, and just to point out that while we have challenges in the preclinical space, right, it's very difficult to put a um, 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 to put um, some of the wearables um, onto animals and ask them to please leave them alone. Um, but the technology is there, and I think the challenge is really to us, on us, as to how we um, implement them. Um, one more example. Um, and so um, in, uh, um, um, this is an example of a vest that um, COPD patients um, can wear again around uh, the value of a respiratory rate. Um, and, um, you know, working towards ways of measurement that have um, as minimal of an impact on the patient as possible, which again, I think is something that we strive to do um, in our preclinical setting as well, right? And when we think about respiratory rate, um, you know, there are, there are probably inherent changes um, when we start to uh, manipulate the animal. And so if we, have a, um, if we have a remote and continuous way of doing this, um, our opportunity to collect um, valuable data um, um, goes up significantly. Um, a next to final point that I'll make is that as we begin to integrate some of these de digital technologies, um, the thoughtful application of artificial intelligence and deep learning to make sense of these larger by orders of magnitude data sets will be critical in order to gain the most impact on drug discovery and improving our care and use of preclinical species. A caveat is that any useful algorithm is based on data sets that have already been collected and so we will still need human intelligence and intervention 
as new data or novel effects are observed. And with a much larger data set, the challenge of separating translatable and relevant signal from noise takes on greater importance. None of these digital, um, none of these digital measures, markers, or endpoints should be looked at um, in, in isolation, right? We need to use our um, use our increasing understanding of fields like genomics, immunology, and oncology, just as a few, just as a few examples. Um, right? We need to apply those um, to the novel insights that we gain, which will hopefully allow us to best understand which preclinical findings are truly translatable, um, truly translatable to humans. Um, so this is another slide that I borrowed from the um, CTTI, um, and I think that um, they highlight um, 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 some important things to be thinking about as we have the discussion um, about which technology to integrate when. Um, and you know, I, um, one of the challenges that, that I see us as a community facing is how do we move from the, from the small pilot studies um, um, that, that, are, that are very actively going on to really scaling up um, with the possibility of creating, um, you know, a a um, a significant change in um, in the in the in the minimum um, that we get out of any preclinical study. Um, and so, with that, um, I'll leave you to uh, ponder those points. Um, if you'd like, um, um, if you'd like the list of the um, um, papers and websites um, that I've mentioned, um, shoot me an email, and I'll happily provide that. Um, I hope you enjoyed our little chat, and um, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. McGuire, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2019. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.